This is what we're going to talk about, uh, the 25 years of making civilization. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is who, this is me. I've been making games for like 30 some years and uh, the only thing that's relevant is I was on the first civilization team. I guess that's why I'm here. And these are our panelists. I'd like each of them to speak a little bit about their careers, what they did. I'll start with you, Sid. I'm Sid Meyer. Um, I uh, co-founded Microprose way back in the uh, early 80s. And for the purposes of this discussion, um, I designed the original civilization uh, back in uh, 1991. We're celebrating the 25th anniversary of civilization this year. It's very exciting. Um, and uh, thanks to all of you for supporting the game. We really appreciate it. Brian? Uh, so I'm Brian Reynolds. I, this is actually also my 25th year in the game industry, as well as the 25th anniversary of Civilization. I uh, came to Micropose right as Sid was finishing that game up, and uh, I was the lead designer for Civilization II, and then later went on to do Big Huge Games, and was at Zynga for a long time, and now at Big Huge Games again. Soren? Uh, I'm Soren Johnson. Uh, I joined Fraxis in 2000, uh, which was basically right when Civ 3 was starting up. I uh, started as a programmer there. Eventually, I was the, uh, this was the co-designer on Civ 3, and then I was the lead designer of, uh, of Civ 4. Um, you know, and since then, I've worked at EA some, and now I run a, a, a strategy game studio called Mohawk Games. So, um, 25 years, 18 platforms, 66 SKUs, 33 million units sold. It's been a wonderful game. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I wanted to ask, I mean, Swarm is going to speak about this later, but I wanted to, why don't you talk about the metrics from Civ 5 just briefly? Yeah, we've been talking some about, like, you know, how much people play Civ, and we always hear anecdotally, you know, this is the game that, you know, I flunked out of college for, or, you know, like, <laughs> you know, it cost me my job or whatever, and, like, people talk about how much they play this game. Um, but until Civ 5, like, we never really knew exactly how much people played the game. Um, because Civ 5 is on Steam, and, you know, basically every, uh, if you bought Civ 5, it was attached to your Steam account, we can know. And the current numbers are, you know, there's over 8 million copies of Civ 5 sold, and the average play time is over 150 hours. Um, so basically, the average person has played four work weeks of, of Civ 5. <laughs> and uh, if, you, if you multiply those together, there's over a billion hours of Civ 5 has been played. So who knows what that number would be if you put all of them together, um, but <laughs> a lot. And these are box covers. Uh... I, was, I, the, I have this in a, anecdotally, I'm not sure about these numbers for sure, but I think Civ 1 sold like a million and a half copies. Every game since has sold more, and like Soren mentioned, 8 million approximately at copies of Civ 5. So here's a turn-based strategy game that, that gets getting better and better as the world changes in terms of games. This game is still holding its place as a revered and popular game. I remember a funny little thing in, you know, in 1995 when we were making Civ 2, um, we would get really concerned. People would come around and tell you, if you don't capture the user's attention in the first hour of the gameplay, <laughs> then you're really in trouble. So that's what 1995 was like. Uh, these days, it's like the first three seconds or something like right. that. Right. I mean, I remember. I remember. We felt we had we had 15 minutes to grab somebody's attention at, at Ensemble Studios, and now, like you're right, it's minutes, it's seconds now. So I want to start with Sid. I think we need to start with you. I know you've answered this question a million times, but how did civilization come about? And were there things that inspired you? Let's, I know uh, you've covered that before, but it's, I think we should review that. Well, there's kind of a, a golden period in microprose when, when you and I worked together on uh, uh, Railroad Tycoon first, uh, Covert Action, and then we, we hit upon this idea uh, for civilization. But we'd been kind of turned loose, I think. First we did Pirates, for example. Uh, uh, we'd, we'd, we'd made our reputation with some, some stim simulator games, some flight simulators, but um, <clears throat> we kind of got turned loose and pirates kind of hit people like that, and then we were, we were free to do whatever we wanted. And, you know, I know you love railroads, and I thought railroads were cool, so we made this railroad tycoon game, and it was really the, the, the era of SimCity was out there, other games were out there, they were kind of, uh, there was this hint that strategy might be something cool. We were, we were very, leery of strategy because it, uh, in, you know, in those days it connoted uh, 
a big map with a bunch of counters and taking two hours to set up and then not being very much fun to play. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> putting strategy games on, on a computer uh, was kind of a, was a revelation. You could start to play right away. You had this first hour of, of fun. <laughs> and um, so we, we uh, based on what our experience with Railroad, we said, you know, kind of what's a bigger topic? What's a more epic topic? You know, the, the fun of these games is starting with something small, but ending up with something incredible that you had created yourself, that was your own, your, your own story, had uh, your own decisions had created this, 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 uh, this story. So, you know, what about, uh, what about the history of civilization? You know, cool, all sorts of fun stuff to do there. And we were inspired by, in some, in some sense, by SimCity with that kind of uh, god game building aspect. There was a game called Empire out there at the time that had some of this map revelation things that we, that we borrowed. Uh, ironically, very little of the game came from the Civilization board game. That, that game was kind of limited to a certain era and had some very board gamey mechanics. Um, and uh, part of it was uh, our, our experience with Railroad Tycoon, where we had um, operating the railroad, you, there was some economics, there was competition, there was uh, all different aspects kind of worked together. And the, the core of civilization was this idea of um, a number of simple systems, the, the exploration system, the combat system, the economic system, the growth system, were all very uh, tangible. You filled up a bucket with food, and all of a sudden a new population person popped out. So everything was understandable on its own. But once they started interacting, it became the, the decisions became very interesting, and it became the core of, of the Civ, of Civ One. So I remember thinking that we were doing something special at the time. Do you, do you recall any wow moment or was it just a gra did you realize you were making something really special or do you, was there a wow moment or just a gradual appreciation that this was going to be a special game? It felt good. It felt fun to play. You never really know, you know, you're, you always like your game whether, your kid is always cute, you know, whether other people feel that way or not, you never know. But, uh, <laughs> so I think we felt that, that the game was fun and uh, what, was, what was rewarding was it was, we knew we were, were, it was different that there were no games out there like this. And the fact that we could make, be breaking so much new ground and still be having fun, I think, was, was what was reward, rewarding. Because uh, it, at any moment, it could have all blown up, I think. You know? And the fact that we kind of made it work was very satisfying. I'd like to ask Brian and Soren, take put on your hats as gamers. And remember, what was the first time you, your first experience playing Civ in some frame? Was it Civ 1? Or you must have been Civ 1 for you. I'm not sure about you. Soren, but do you remember your, what your impressions were? Oh, first? I do, I do, because I was actually working at uh, Microprose. It was my first couple of months, maybe three months in, and, and I found out that you could go get, for, you know, go ask Sid for a copy of this new game he was working on, and it was really fun, and you should try it. So I went and got it, and I stuck it in. It was right after work, and I said, I'll play this for an hour or two, and... Uh, and you know, see what it's all about. And the next thing I remembered, it was 2.30 in the morning and there was nobody else at the <laughs> office. <laughs> and there I was playing that thing. And, and so I, I was sort of in the industry and in the company at the time, but I was this brand new guy, uh, which didn't stop me from being really opinionated about the game. And so I have somewhere on some 386 computer, a set of subdirectories where Sid would make changes in the game that I didn't agree with, so I would save the old version so I could go back and play it the way it was really cool when ships worked right and stuff like that. So that, was, that got me started on uh, having opinions. Do you remember Soren? Uh, yeah, I do remember. Uh, it, was, it was my, it sounds so stereotypical, it was literally my first week of college. I was at the college bookstore buying my books from all my classes, and then I saw over there in the corner this game called Civilization. You know, by Sid Meier, and um, and so of course I bought it. Uh, and I do remember at the time, like, you know, it, it actually did seem like a very natural step forward. Uh, I've been a, a fan of Microprose and Sid's games, um, and uh, you know, there's just a lot of stuff in the air of, with games like Populous and SimCity and Railroad Tycoon. It seems like things were trending so that someone should make a game that's about you know all of world history, and it just seemed perfect that it would be Sid. So I'm like, I'm probably gonna like this game. And I did. That <laughs> took up a ton of my time uh, my first year of college. I had to kind of put it away <laughs> so I could move forward. Um, but then, you know, then once I got done, it was like this amazing that I was able to go from that you know, into Civ 3 as soon as I finished school. So, Sid, I want to talk to you, ask you again about um, 
we're going to get into the making of the game a little bit more later, later. but I want us about, so Civ 1, you do Civ 1, but you don't do Civ 2. I mean, like, uh, what was the, I mean, think about those games up there, and somebody was, some other than Civ was a lead designer in all those except Civ Revolution, I believe. Right. So, I mean, that, that's, an, that's unusual, I think, in our industry that the team doesn't carry forward and do version after version. So what was your thinking there when you turned it over to Brian and Jeff, I think? Or I Brian? think once you do a Civ game, you're pretty much <laughs> exhausted. I mean, the, there's so many possibilities, there's so many decisions, so many things to decide whether you're going to put them in or take them out. And um, it was really like, th those were all the ideas I had about the game, you know? And, uh, but something about Civ seems to bring out the game designer, because I remember in those days, pre-internet, we would get handwritten letters, and they would, they would basically follow a certain format. It's like, first paragraphs, dear Sid, you know, I enjoyed your game, Civilization, it's very cool, I had fun. By the way, this is what I would change about it, this is what's wrong with it. Uh, you know, please feel free to give me credit for these ideas if you use them. You know, so, uh, Civ seemed to bring out the, the game designer in people, and I, you know, Brian was really able to take advantage of that with Civ 2 and, and, and the modding ideas, but, um, it, it, it really, ex I think it's exhausting to design a civilization game, and I had no, you know, additional ideas, you know, and then, and, and Brian had a lot of cool ideas, so it's like, you go, you go, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brian, let's talk about Civ 2. So, you, yep. um, you're asked to make this game, and now right. you've got, you've got this resource, you've got all these people of, Tell us, you got all this information, people wanted things. And that, yeah. was, a, that was a source of ideas, and I'm sure you had some of your own. Right. Let me, let me just mention yeah. one thing. Uh, before that, Brian made Colonization, which is an awesome game and really ought to be considered part of the Civ canon, I think. But I mean, that, you know, he really showed what he could do there, and it was, it was, it was great. So you felt comfortable. Part yeah. of the Isation <laughs> 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 series, the Isation team. So at the time that it turned, it turned out we were going to do uh, Civ 2, there weren't a lot of sequels out there to open-ended games, and I think SimCity 2000 was the first one that we had ever seen that was a big success, uh, which I think started to give people the idea that, hey, maybe we should do a sequel to our open-ended game. Uh, and in, in fact, the wor our internal working title for the game was Civilization 2000, um, and you know, eventually, fortunately, we called it Civ 2. Otherwise, I don't know what we would have called all the uh, <laughs> other ones after that. Um, but there was a lot of, there had been five years of people reacting to the game and begging for more and uh, of course a lot of people asked for, well let's see what happens when they get to Alpha Centauri or something like that and other people asked for just more improvements to the game. So there was just a lot of stuff out there on, I mean it was really the kind of early internet, it was usually the stuff we got a hold of came from the internet news groups, the Usenet stuff, and there was a, somebody had even compiled and curated the, you know, the official Usenet list of Civilization II suggestions, and we kind of went through that list and did as many of them as we could. Uh, we didn't really know how to do a sequel back then, and so we had to figure out, well, what is a sequel to a game where you're not continuing the story with some characters because it was the entire history of the world and it was the characters and events that you made. Uh, so we kind of came down to, well, we're gonna just try to improve lots of little things and maybe take things that had been sketched in broad strokes before and uh, fill them out a little bit or uh, take suggestions, small suggestions from the internet, and it made it a really hard game to demo for somebody because executives would come by and they would say, oh, so this is just kind of civilization, uh, it's just kind of civilization just on Windows or something like that. And, and, they, and you couldn't really get anybody um, that wasn't a gamer to understand how cool this was going to be, but we all we're playing it and we thought it was, you know, we'd walk around at night and every single person in the company would have it up on their screen and we'd think, okay, I, I think it's fun, so I think it's going to do well. But we had to just kind of stumble our way through what, what a sequel even is to a game about the whole history of the world. So how, Soren, did you proceed having to deal with that? You're now the third on the list, right? Everything, everything all the cool stuff had been done, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what could be done? Um, yeah, well, SIF 3 was a, uh, an interesting project, uh, especially since it kind of felt like uh, you know, I was, it was literally my first, my first full-time job in the industry, um, and they had hired a few other programmers who also were, you know, very, very new. 
Um, and you know, it was kind of up to us to figure out what to do with, with Civ. Um, and uh, I think with, with Civ 3, our main, our main idea was um, you know, we wanted to you know, preserve the core of Civ you know, and add some new things, right? Uh, for Civ 3, what that meant was you know, culture, uh, resources, uh, you know, probably the, the bargaining table you see in, in diplomacy, uh, you know, kind of those are the, the big new things. Um, and, but we didn't have a lot of time with that game. I think we made that basically in about 18 months. Um, and, uh, but once, uh, once that was done, it was really nice to be able to, then I, I was really, you know, you can only, like, like Sid mentioned that it's hard to do multiple civs. Um, but with Civ 3, it's kind of like I was able, I joined not really at the very beginning. And so I was really excited to work on Civ 4, where it was a game where I could be the first person on. You know, the first person to start the code base and figure out exactly what to do with the game. Um, and I'm sure something we're gonna bring up at some point today is the idea of one third old, one third improved, one third new. You know, that's kind of a good guiding principle for uh, moving a franchise forward. Um, so, you know, I, you know, I looked at, you know, what are the core parts of Civ that we need to look, keep the same? You know, what are some of the new things? And for Civ 4, that meant, um, Probably great people, uh, religion, and uh, the promotions for the units that your units could actually level up. Um, but also, it was kind of I think the first the first Civ, uh, first version in this series where we really reevaluated some of the core ideas that had been been with Civ from the very beginning. Um, because I think that when you work in a franchise like this, you're always afraid of like I don't want to screw up the formula, right? That um, was the great fear hanging yeah. over me. I did not want to be the guy that went down in history as having broken civilization. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, is there something magic in there that we don't understand that, like, if I, if I take it apart, I won't be able to put it back together again? Um, but with Civ 4, it was like we, we really had the time to do that, to, like, you know, not, not make any, not bring any of the old assumptions forward and kind of start over from scratch. Uh, and I think that really served the project well. Um, and I think that was the same philosophy that they went, went into with, with Civ 5. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it seems to have worked. Yeah, I think that's a good, that's a good point, uh, um, that this franchise has really been able to sustain itself over this period of time. And I think we know many of the classic games that kind of crashed and burned for one reason or another. And that, that idea of uh, keeping one third of the, the, the core, uh, improving one third of the game, and then adding one third new features has kind of allowed us to, to stay in contact with our, with our players, but also uh, introduce new players to the game. And there's always a temptation, you know, I think some franchises have kind of gone in the overly complex, overly large direction and kind of crashed and burned. Um, or there's, there's, there's different reasons why, you know, that. that a good idea can turn into a bad idea. And you know, Brian just mentioned how he didn't want to be the, the guy who destroyed civilization. Uh, I, I just remember there was, a, there was a weird artifact in the original Civ where uh, grasslands, some would give you uh, a shield and some wouldn't. And I had designed the game, first they all had shields and that was too many shields and then we took them away and there was not enough shields. So I said, well, maybe every other, you know, every other grassland should have a shield. And then I hear from you know Brian a couple years later. You know, went through the same thing. I tried, I tried it. You know, that was too much, and that was too little. So there was some little magic things in there that you know that we we kind of were very leery of touching. And then Soren had the courage to go and change those things. Yeah, I got rid of that. I forget, forget what I replaced it with, but it seems like it worked. Young kid. Uh, when, when <laughs> so, so let me ask you about. I mean, this chart, there's a progression here from one to five, and then we have this other game in the middle here called Civilization Revolution. Do you yes. want to speak about your goal for that? Yeah, I, I uh, had, the idea of Civilization Revolution was really to bring it to, to consoles, to, to try and make a, a version that would uh, introduce new players, essentially, to, to Civilization. And a kind of a, a chance for me to, to reevaluate the game and uh, take, a, take a fresh look at it. And th that was kind of my perspective. Uh, was what are the really, really fun parts and how do we pack them into an evening? You know, Soren mentioned 150 hours of gameplay. Not everybody has 150 hours to play the game. Uh, so how do you kind of pack the civilization experience into an evening? And uh, it's turned out to have a really interesting life on, on mobile, the, you know, on, on the iPad and things like that. So it's kind of a, a, a introductory version of civilization for for those who don't have four weeks to take off of work to, uh, to play. But they're not going to college. <laughs> right. 
where you can play games all day. <laughs> so I want to ask about a more meaty question, maybe why, why has Civilization remained so popular for 25 years? What is going on when people play that game? It, it holds their attention year after year. They want to, they're waiting for the next version. They're so, they've been through maybe several of them, if not all five, and they want, they've got ideas they want to see. I mean, I mean, I think that we have, as professionals, we have to understand that and make that magic happen. So what do you think was going on there? I'll start with you, Sid, if you like. I think the community has sustained the game over the years. I mean, and it, they've, so many of their ideas and their energy has gone into the, to the game to, to keep it alive, you know, in the forums everywhere. And you know, I think when, when Brian introduced the idea of, of modding, uh, that the game just took off because uh, people want that, feel that ownership, feel they, 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 they want to design their own game, have the game work the way they, they want to play. So um, I think it's been, it's been that community. We had a, uh, our Firaxicon event uh, recently where you know, a lot of our gamers came to, 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 to see Firaxis and talk with us. And I was struck by the kind of multi-generational aspect. Now, there are fathers bringing their sons and daughters and mothers, you know, that people who'd grown up with civilization were now introducing it to their children. And that, you know, I think that, that there's something about playing the game that you feel a satisfaction, you know, a pride in having won, and, and it's something you want to share with, with, with people, uh, you know, either online or with your family. So I think that's part of the, part of the long-term appeal. But do you have an idea, Brian? It's yeah, so I, I think, first of all, the whole arc of human history from the beginning and you get to be the ruler, I think that's a pretty... Uh, epic topic, and it's also, it, it speaks to stuff that we all either know or think we know. Uh, you know, we weren't always teaching you history. We'd sometimes try to sneak in a little actual history, but, but we would play on the things that, that people did already know about history, and, and you know, it, it goes to sort of a common, uh, a common humanity we all have, and plus the desire to rule it all. And when you <laughs> combine that with the, that core mechanic of move the little piece and move another one and jump around. You know, when they, if you want to make a, a pay, your novel into a real page turner, they say to have it shift perspective a lot from this arc to that arc and this perspective, this person and that person, and that somehow draws you on because you want to find out what's happening with all these threads. And I think that's sort of where the, the just one more turn thing and the suddenly noticing it's 2 a.m. thing, I think there's this core uh, really effective mechanic in there that, you know, that has stayed true through all the, the versions of it. You know, that, that's probably the, the beating heart of the game system is this really uh, addictive mechanic. Yeah, I think of that. I describe that that concept as sort of like there's all those overlapping goals uh, in, in Civ. You know, you're like, okay, I got to get iron working, but while you're doing, once you get iron working, it's like, well, now I got to make sure I finish the pyramids. And then we, you know, while you finish the pyramids, well, I also got to make sure I capture Paris. And like, oh, I got to make sure I do this. And like, there's never there's never a good moment to put down the game of Civ, which is why people often end up putting it down at you know five in the morning, right? right. Um, and it's also interesting how many people have told me that when they, um, they play a game of Civ and if they, they save it, you know, they play it late, they aren't able to finish it, they save it, and the next time they play, instead of um, loading that old save, they're I'm just going to start a new game, right? Like that, that's, that's pretty common. Some people play like that. And that's kind of because, like, once you're playing, it's like that becomes your world, you know? And, like, you can load the save in your computer, but you can't really load that old mindset, you know, into your brain where you were before. Um, yep. And just to mention, uh, Civ 1, and all the Civs, but specifically Civ 1, had this uh, amazing manual that Bruce created, I think, that really supported the fantasy of the game and, and helped you to uh, uh, step into that world. And uh, I think it gave it a kind of heft and a, and, a, and, a, and a, a, you know, it felt like a real, that you were really the, the leader. And, and if you did have to kind of step away with the computer for a, a couple of minutes, Frank. For any reason, you can take it with you and uh, read up. <laughs> Four iPads. All right. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, you, you, I think you touched on this, Brian, especially, and, and Soren, too, about something about the way the game is built, the principles of the design. Not, nothing specific about the, the, the content, but how it's built. The, the fundamental design things that are working in that game. I think we, I remember we identified playing Empire Deluxe we looked at 
these are things that are part of Empire Deluxe that we need, that should be in, are, are great concepts, like the hidden map and uh, the randomly generated map and uh, uh, that decision making, leading to more decisions. I, mean, I think that this, it, uh, it seems pretty fundamental to Civ too, I think. Would you have any, anything else that you can think of as a, of a, a feature that people can take away as a, as a course in design? Well, certainly the tech tree was the other signature thing. I, when I very, the first time I saw the game, I, since I had played zillions of hours of Empire Deluxe in, uh, in college, I immediately recognized the Empire part. And I was like, oh, it's like Empire with history and this technology thing. And I'd never seen the technology thing before, but that's something I think is, is really aspirational uh, when you when you get to pick which one you're going to discover next, you know, you're kind of offered a selection and, and then you get mathematics and that leads you to some awesome new way to beat up other, other countries. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was a fun, aspirational thing and I think that stayed with, uh, stayed with Civ throughout. I'm, I mean, I, it's not my place, but I'm going to say a couple things. One is, uh, at one point you said you gave me a task to come up with 10 things I would change about Empire Deluxe to make it a better game. And I was trying to show that I was a worthy employee, so I came up with 12, I remember. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know if any of those went in the game, it's, uh, the list is long gone. I'm sure they all did. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just remember that, con that task. Um, okay, I want to move on to uh, technology, the gaming, the underlying technology of games. We, you, know, I, you know, it's been changing radically all throughout our careers. Did that changes in technology that you, you had to deal with, did that make, was that important to the way the game proceeded or evolved? Uh, do you expect that to continue? To, I'm sorry. Yeah, well in my case, uh, we had just kind of recently uh, moved up to the IBM PC computer. And we had 640K of memory to enjoy. Uh, and that kind of allowed what we, what we did with, with civilization, I mean the various reports and city screens and all that kind of stuff. So I think the technology at that point had come to where we could implement the, the rules and give you just enough visual information that you could tell what was going on. Uh, I proudly uh, claim that I did most of the art for that game. But there were only 16 colors to work with, so. <laughs> but 16 was a big deal. <laughs> yeah, that, if that you could work a, with was, four, 16 was a yes, big deal. it was yeah. awesome having all those colors <laughs> and color cycling, wow. Uh, so, um, so I think we, we did as much as we could with the technology, and I think that's been a, a, a constant thread, but you know, I think uh, Brian and Soren can talk to how they uh, responded to that. Yeah, so the big thing that happened with Civ 2 was that Windows came out, or, or a, a version of Windows existed that people were starting to use. You know, there had been earlier versions of Windows that, that weren't mass market or successful. Uh, but Windows 3.1 was already out, and the key thing was that Windows 95 was coming. And, and it, was, it was cool. If anybody that ever had suffered through their autoexec.bat and config.sys just to even make something run, you know, there was a high bar of entry to even be a player of a game back in, in those days, and, and it really limited our market. And so with this thing coming that was going to make, you know, obviously there were already Macintoshes, but most people were, you know, stuck with uh, this more traditional PC kind of machine. And so when an operating system was coming out that was going to make it so that they could actually understand it, use it, uh, easy to configure, that was a big deal. And we decided to kind of get on that. And we sort of leaned into it with Civ 2. You could resize the other little windows even inside the game, and it would reorganize how things went. And so we, we were trying to, uh, at a time when Windows was really cool, uh, do the most we could to lean into that. And one really good result for, in particular, Civ 2, but you know, I guess that made it possible to continue the series, was the fact that if you had a computer that would run Windows 95, then it would run Civ 2. And that meant even the laptops, which was kind of a new thing back then, could run Civ 2. And so we'd see people on the airplane play in Civ 2. And I think that was a really big deal for the series, that it was universally compatible with all computers at the time it came out. You know, that's, that's hard to arrange in the, you know, quote unquote, AAA industry in the PC world particularly, so I think that was 
uh, was a biggie. We got a, a big help from Windows 95. You mentioned laptops. It reminds me that at, on my flight out here a couple days ago, uh, I looked across the aisle, and there was a guy on the other side who had a laptop, and he was playing Civ 3. <laughs> and I was just like amazed to see that. But anyway, um, I think it's actually interesting to think of when Civ was made in terms of uh, technology and game design, because um, in the late 80s and early 90s, I think it was a real sweet spot for games because uh, there were limit the the limitations of uh, the technology meant you were limited in how much sort of stuff you could put into your game. You couldn't make a game that was overly complex. So, you know, Sid made a game that, you know, required a lot, required a lot of stuff because it's about all of world history, but he couldn't, he couldn't really sort of overdo it and, you know, really weigh the player down with too many systems and too many options and, and so on. So I think that's why the game has this great balance of, like, you know, great gameplay, great topic, and also accessible. You know, often, you know, nowadays when something, if, you know, a lot of the new sort of grand strategy games you see that come up uh, from scratch, you know, you know, in the, you know, in this year are, you know, they're too, they're too complex for a mainstream audience. And I think that when he made it in 91, um, that was able to set sort of a pattern that we're able to follow, you know, later on for the next 25 years without having going down that. Um, sort of that, that slippery slope of making the game too complex and bigger and bigger and like losing the audience as opposed to growing it. Um, like what the role, I see the role that technology played uh, in improving the Civ series in helping us not be um, too heavy handed about how people are supposed to play the game. Um, and so that's especially in the cases of stuff like a modding and, and multiplayer. Um, so the, the part of the community that really commits to the game long term um, and you know, sort of like we're there, ready for the next version when it comes out. Are the people who you know have been you know modding the game, playing all these different versions of it? There's there's so many crazy ways people play this game multiplayer. Uh, there's succession games where someone plays a game for 20 turns and they pass it on to someone else, and they play it for 20 turns, kind of goes around in a ring. Or there are uh, democracy games where you'll see multiple Civ sites play this one multiplayer game against each other where each Civ is basically controlled by like 10 or 15 people who like vote on certain policies and like this guy's the military you know, advisor and this guy's the guy who gets to choose science. Or there are uh, like the pit boss games, which is in Civ 4 there was this standalone server that lets you run a Civ game continually, basically where you take a turn every day. And there, there are games that have been going for years that, you know, that are still being played now. Um, and you know, having, Having that stuff really means that like the community can take the game to places that you know we didn't necessarily expect. Um, you know, you know, Brian started modding with Civ 2, and like every step of the way, something really significant has been added. You know, with Civ 3, we took out all hard coding, so you could add you know as many units and buildings as techs and technologies as you wanted to. Uh, you know, with Civ 4, uh, we let people start modding the, the code itself. You know, that they could they could change the UI, they could all of the game and AI code was. Uh, it put into the source separate DLL where they could change it however they want to. So then we started to see people start making, you know, sci-fi mods and you know fantasy mods for for Civ 4, where you know like there was suddenly this magic system which was not you know obviously in the base game at all. Um, with Civ 5, they integrated uh, Steamworks or the Steam Workshop uh, into the game, so it made made sharing mods a lot easier and allowing people to have multiple mods playing at the same time. Um, and I mean, that's, that's just been such a huge thing for the audience. And it sometimes was hard to, um, it's sometimes hard to justify the value of modding to people more on the business side. You know, but you know, being, oh, in, yes. <laughs> you know, being in the, the dev trenches and working closely with the community on Civ, like I can definitely attest to the fact that that's what keeps that community going year after year. Yeah, so we, I have to tell one little story that in the, uh, I guess it was about 20 years ago this week, so February of 96. Uh, this was the final run up, the last month before Civ 2 launch. And you know, I was still kind of hastily putting in some, I was interested in this, um, the scenario builder, map editor kinds of things. and. I think some executive came in and saw me working, you know, what are you working on? And was this map editor so you can change the maps? And, and it was sort of, um, I don't think you should work on that. I think you should work on getting the game launched. Uh, and it, it, let's just cut that stuff. Let's cut all that stuff and 
you know, make sure we meet, meet the deadline on the game. So, you know, this is why I am a producer, every producer's nightmare. <laughs> so I, of course, worked on nothing but the scenario editor and modding stuff until it was done because, of course, you got to get it in and then, you know, then the game will get out when the game gets out, but you want to make sure the, the feature gets in. So, so yes, I did that and um, it turned out it was a good idea. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I, I, I was interested to hear what you, especially what you were talking about, Soren, how as I play this game, I'm investing in my civilization. I'm internally I'm investing, but without, as you I proceeded down its progression here, you allowed people to invest externally. They could, they could, they could turn, they could make the game into the game they wanted. So it was not, no, that's just, you, it's like, I mean, I'm not sure of the analogy, but you give them paint and brushes and they painted their own world. But, but there was, you could, you could do it by the numbers maybe, play the game as just a design, or you could, you, and, and or you could go over here to this other canvas and paint your own damn picture with it. You thing. could start being, the, it, it lets you in to kind of be part of the game design process. So if you didn't, you know, if you had strong opinions about civilization, you could just go edit the file and change the rules. Well, and, said it's probably safe you hadn't expected that to happen. When you that is it. true. <laughs> I thought we had all the answers, but I was wrong. Um, now I remember looking at, uh, I mean, there's an amazing story behind Civ 2. I mean, Brian spent a year in England he disappeared for a year and yep. came back with Civilization II, basically. So I mean, it was just, just amazing. But I remember seeing it, and uh, one of the front page main screen menu items was cheat. And I was like, cheat? Well, wait a minute. We're, we're, you know, you could cheat in a, a mass of tanks right in next to the enemy. You know, I was like, wait a minute. We're the designers. We, that's not right. And, and then I watched my son play, and he brought in a legion of tanks right next to and, and there was this gigantic grin on his face. So I said, okay, I get it. <laughs> Cheating is fun, I guess. The guy that put cheat on the, open, on the top menu. <laughs> I think there's a risk there, because I met a fellow once who played Railroad Tycoon, and he said he figured out how to cheat, and he never played the game again, because he could, he could never lose. It was never a challenge after that. Yep. So we gotta be care I would say be careful with that. Um, I, there's another question for all of you. Is like, were there lessons you learned making Civ that you carried with you for the rest of your career so far? I mean, is this something that you remember? I mean, I, I maybe mean, this is, you can skip it if you don't want it, if you don't think of anything, but uh, I, think, I think I took things away. But I don't know, maybe there's something. I think for me, it probably coalesced this kind of interesting decisions idea. I mean, I think Civ encourages you to think about game design as a science or as an art or whatever it is. And um, you know, for the first time, we kind of looked at a game and stepped back and said, well, why does this game work? And how can we use these ideas in the future? And I, you know, for me, it was kind of that idea. Oh, I see, the, you know, there's these interesting decisions that are kind of constantly flowing past the player. And, you know, focus on that and, and, and that, that's part of the I remember you saying, saying to our, our group one time that a game is a series of interesting decisions. I've you been struggling that. with that <laughs> definition. I've been trying to come up with a better definition ever since. Or Brian or Soren, do you have it? Yeah, so well, I think for me, I mean, Civ Civilization II happened relatively early in my career, certainly by the 25-year length standards now. And it's always ever after been, you know, it's still kind of the, the standard against which I compare myself. I'm always thinking, you know, am I ever going to do a game as cool as Civ II was? And I'm always, any new game is always like, is this going to be as cool as Civ II was? I think the stuff I learned, you know, at that time I was still, or leading into it, particularly on colonization, I was still being, you know, mentored with Sid. So he was teaching me his secret, uh, uh, his secret formulas, and and I remember the the weirdest one, but the one that stays with me, and I, I still use it, is, you know, whenever you're going to change a number, you know, you need to double it or cut it in half. You know, no, no kind of half-ass, ten percent <laughs> stuff, and and. And that's a really, been a really good rule because it, uh, it makes sure you can tell that you've had an effect, first of all. If you can't even tell you had an effect when you double it, you need to just go double it again. Uh, and, you know, afterwards maybe you can adjust it and balance it, but I really do kind of stick by that. And, you know, when I see somebody going 5% on something, I say, yeah, you know, let's just double that and, and make sure we understand what that variable even does. So. Yeah, you taught me. You think it's something? Uh, yeah, probably a couple things. There, I mean, another good Sid rule of thumb that's definitely always stuck with me is the idea that it should be the player it should be the one having the fun, not the not the computer or or the designer. Um, and it seems like it just happens over and over again. When I come up with an idea and I want to design it, and I make it too complex at the beginning, you know, and players don't get it. 
Uh, a good example for that would be like the way religion worked originally in Civ 4. Originally it was kind of like this black box where I had all these kind of interesting calculations going on about how religion spread. You know, it spreads by trade routes and if you have similar cultures and if you build temples near each other and all these, but all these calculations were hidden. They were all sort of inside of the machine. Like, Sounds really cool. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, listen, I'm being so clever, you know, but like, you know, the player's response was just like, we don't know what's going on. I'm just, I, I'm just either going to ignore it or get frustrated. And, you know, eventually the, the system we came up with was just like, well, let's just drop all that. You build a missionary, you move it to a city, you press a button, and it gets the religion, right? It's like the simplest, easiest, like our job would be so easy if we just remember, like, do the simple thing. <laughs> you know, start with the simple thing, not the complex thing. Um, and sort of like, you know, in line with that, uh, the other thing I learned is like, at a certain point, your community understands your game better than you do. You know, you're never going to be able to play the game nearly as much as, as your, your community does. So, you know, listen to them and, and take what they say seriously. Um, you know, with Civ 4, we got, we, I, we became very familiar with the Civ 3 community, and so we brought, you know, 100 or 200 of those players. Uh, we gave them access to Civ 4, like, about a year and a half before we shipped. It was kind of like early access, except oh, 10 years ago, and, <laughs> and kind of private, but it made a huge difference in the, in the quality of that product. And so I'm, I'm a big believer in that, you know, for any game. You've got to try to expose it to, a, to people outside your company as, as, as early as possible. Yeah, that idea that the player's always right, I think, is, is, is key. And as designers, we fight that a lot of time. You know, somebody said, well, I, I played your game for half an hour, I was having fun up on this point, and then I stopped having fun. And your reaction is, no, you didn't. You, you were still having fun. But uh, <laughs> they're right, and we're wrong. So um, do you recall any moments during the making your games that really stand out, any particular, like, a wow moment or something like that? Uh, it was important to make the success of the game, or it was a laugh, or it was a relief that you figured it out, that it worked. Um, was, it, and was it safe to say that working on Civilization was a source of great personal satisfaction? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all vote, all vote, everybody say aye. Aye, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I had to carry a 40-pound um, computer through um, British customs uh, because to go over to England to develop, they gave me, a, it was a, it was a 486-66, and they could do 640 by 480 graphics, and, Hello. now we're talking, but it was, this was kind of before laptops were very powerful, so I had, it was called like a portable, and it was like this briefcase, and I had to walk through the customs and say I had this computer, and I remember the bill for it, like the invoice for it was eight thousand seven hundred dollars is how much a 48666 in portable form was uh, in, in those days and so I you know there was there was kind of the um, hit and miss over if I was going to have to pay duty over it but that, that, that was a, a sort of uh, uh, bizarre behind the scenes making of Civ 2 moment <laughs> I have a recollection of um, as we shipped Civ 1 Civ 1 kind of out into the ether and to silence in those days, there was no, no feedback, no day zero patching. Um, and a couple months later, I got a call from, from Bill Staley, who was the president of, of Microprose. He was at a conference somewhere, a convention or a trade show. I don't know. He goes, Sid, I think we're onto something here with this Civ game. People seem to be liking it. And bye. You know, yeah, it's kind of like, oh, great. I think our game might be good. You know? So in those days, as opposed to today, you really had no idea for quite a while whether your game was working or not. Right. But I remember that moment when Bill called and, and he was at it somewhere and yeah, I think this game is pretty good. Might be onto something here. Okay. Wasn't he, was he getting an award or something? And it could have been. He was I, shocked. He was, oh, I'm getting an award. I don't even know what I'm here for. I remember that uh, we were told, um, you know, by members of our company that, that Civ 2 was projected to sell 38,000 copies worldwide lifetime. That was, uh, and so all the marketing that we got was kind of geared with that amount of sales in mind. Uh, so we were happy to prove them wrong. <laughs> well, I want to congratulate you on using up almost all my cards. <laughs> and uh, we're just about out of time, but I'd like, to, I'd like to agree we all meet in 25 years to talk about the 50th anniversary. Absolutely. All right. It's a deal. And thank you for... 2046 is, or when, 2041? <laughs> math, math is not our yeah. strong Math is not our <laughs> Well, I, I hope you found that enjoyable, and thank you for coming, Thanks, and uh, enjoyed it. Thank you. Lots of fun.